Americans, but just in case. My name is Nathan Juarez. I'm a doctoral student at the University of Oregon. Today I'm going to be playing Cartograph by Andy Akiho.
Awesome job. Oh my gosh. Congratulations on learning this piece. It's incredible. For everyone who's listening, actually, um, so this is uh, a movement from uh, a much larger work called Seven Pillars uh, by Andy Kehoe that Sandbox sort of worked on and, and, and uh, commissioned. Uh, a couple years back, we released an album of it. We tore it. Uh, it's a sort of 11 movement work. And this is the penultimate movement. Um, so to sort of contextualize a little bit uh, kind of what you're hearing, um, it's part of a much larger form. Congratulations on just learning this piece, though, because it's just it's, it's incredible. Every single note that you're hearing, every single instrument that Nathan is playing on is meticulously notated and composed by Andy. Um, and it's, it's really, uh, it's quite a feat as a performer to, to take on this work and to, to really learn it, uh, to take it on and, and to sort of champion it. So it's really, congratulations. I that's, also just want to great thing. toss in there that Victor's being modest, but it's a piece that was actually written for Victor uh, uh, in, in within the, the group sandbox. So obviously you didn't want to throw that out there, but, but I, I think it's worth mentioning that, yeah, the, the, Victor, how many times have you performed this piece? Probably a bunch of times. Bunch yeah, of times. yeah. <laughs> 30, 40 times. Maybe yeah. 50, yeah. Um, and I was going to say, it's, it's interesting hearing the piece um, not in the context of Seven Pillars. I feel like I've only probably performed it maybe once or twice not in the context of Seven Pillars, and it's so interesting the, the sort of different take on it that you can have when it's sort of extracted from the piece because it's sort of like, I mean, as you can hear, it's kind of a drum solo of sorts, right? There's like, it's crazy, there's all these rhythms, it's really flashy and virtuosic, um, and it really kind of holds that place in Seven Pillars. It's sort of like the penultimate movement, it's sort of like an injection of adrenaline right before the final movement, um, and we kind of feel it that way. The couple times I've played it by myself, like not in the context of Seven Pillars, there's actually like all of these like different uh, sorts of pacing ideas that we can throw in there. Um, and getting to live with the piece for a long amount of time, I think that we're able to sort of live with it a little bit more to like feel it flow and being a little bit more free. I hope that like, not just with Cartograph, but any performer who has a chance to like uh, play a piece of music for a long period of time, they can really sort of like see how it evolves. And for me, it has really evolved in the sense where everything you need to know really in the piece is actually right there in the title. So the piece is called Cartograph, and inside of it there's, um, in uh, capital letters, is the word trap, which has, can have many different meanings, like this is sort of a trap set, there's lots of trap doors that you can fall into, but like it's sort of a play on words. But this idea of cartograph, this idea of like mapping our way through this piece, of like pulling the audience through this piece, it's like, yes, it is a drum solo, and you really earn the right to have it be a drum solo at the end of it, if we really prepare that well, right? I think there's uh, that idea of cartograph. Well, actually, let's talk about the form of the piece really quick. So if you're, Let's look at the first half of the piece and, and form and structure in the sense of like, let's just keep it simple and say like rehearsal letters, right? Um, beginning to D. Letter D is sort of where we like, we really start to, it's D to the end. It really is just sort of like one, one long crescendo. But if we're looking at like A through C, like what are some interesting things you notice about the form? It's definitely like sectioned by the different main themes, I guess. So it, it starts out with this like 30 second note theme, introducing all of the different uh, metal and these three instruments focusing on those. And then we finally, we get a few like moments where it drops down and builds back up. Right, right. And uh, I could probably make more of those softs to like go somewhere with maybe, them. Maybe, or maybe. In my mind, there's actually like three kinds of music in the whole, well, I guess four if you count letter C but sort of four kinds of music until we get to letter D. There's sort of our beginning, our opening, which is a lot of 30 second notes, a lot of fast playing that you heard in the beginning on this cool instrument right here, which I'll just show you all, is a cigar box, which has got a really cool kind of, it's like the Andy Akiho snare drum of sorts. Um, so the first part of the piece is a lot of sort of fast 30 second notes on the, on the cigar box like that, kind of introductory kind of thing, and then we get letter A. Letter A, yeah. And letter A, when I started learning this piece, I was like, why the heck is letter A so darn long? 
And letter B is like that long, <laughs> you know, but letter A is really like, that's really like the meat of this piece. That's really like the cartograph, the trap part of it. There's all these twists and turns, all these little things that you have to kind of navigate. And if we like feel those, like navigating that and sort of like how that feels emotionally, I think it actually influences the way we're playing it, the dynamics, the, the pacing of the tempo. Maybe there's certain moments we want to pull back the tempo a little bit. All of these little things, like thinking of like, like a mountain structure on a map or something like that, this idea of cartograph. Uh, and then letter B, that's really like a different thing. That's sort of our, our power chords. Nathan's got these beautiful uh, cut metal pipes here. These are all pitched and did, you can probably cut these yourself. Yeah. 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 Um, so it's actually just a chromatic set of pipes. And if you saw in the score, it's notated, again, all very meticulously to take the drumstick and sort of play these clusters like that. Those pipes sound really good, actually. Awesome. Um, so letter B kind of like, it evolves a little bit more and it's like maybe a little bit more up in, in, in energy and intensity. And then letter C is obviously its own thing and letter D is obviously its, its own thing. So I'm wondering if maybe, can we look at A? Letter A, and I don't even want to play right now. I, I want to actually, can we sing a little bit of this music sure. together? Yeah, um, there's so many little twists and turns in there, and, and sometimes when we are so focused on what all of the instruments are, and it's like, it's a little different every time. It's like, oh, which one was it? Is it bottle three or bottle two? It's like, oh my gosh, it's like maddening, you know? That's yeah. why it's such a feat to learn this piece, because it's all notated. The top line might be a triangle, and that's this wood block, but the bottom line might be a square, and that's that wood block. You have to sort of, like, the composer has to invent all of this as they're writing the piece, and then it's on the performer to sort of interpret that. So let's not worry about any of that notation right now, and let's actually just, like, Sing some of the contour here at letter A. Maybe we can do a little slower even. One other thing I'd love to throw in is before you can even start learning the notes to the piece, first you have to build your instrument, which I think, Victor, for you, it was a very gradual process of working with Andy. It started with just this table, and then it was just a few pipes. Then with each of the 11 movements, it's like, okay, can I have three more pipes? Okay, how about two more pipes? Suddenly we've got 20 pipes here. And, and so um, we've added an instrument every movement. Every movement. <laughs> there's 11 movements, so every time he added like two or three instruments, eventually we had this. <laughs> and, and I really do have to applaud how uh, meticulously and seriously you took the building of the setup. You know, you didn't just throw it together. This has so much thought behind it. Um, and I think that comes through in the playing as well. So how, how long did it take you to build the whole thing? I've, I've been adjusting it like here and there. Right. I just got a new cigar box because okay. I go through them every now and then. Same, same, yeah. <laughs> um, but like, I started in the fall, like maybe November. Yeah. When I started to awesome. like piece things together. Yeah, yeah. I've been collecting wine bottles and like glass bottles they can attest I have a box of a lot right. of Right, try and all of them. You probably even tune some of them with some water. Yes, I pour some water in there. That's cool, them. that's cool. No, they, it all sounds great. Yeah, the setup is, is really cool. But anyway, back to the singing. I yeah, yeah, yeah. That. yeah. Let's just, let's sing like this first opening to the first sort of stick click okay. thing. Well, even just that will sort of feel some of the different contour there. A little song. Two, ready, and. Awesome, cool. So let's do it one more time. Okay. One more time and we'll, we'll talk about it. Yeah, one more time. Ready? <laughs> awesome, cool. Impossible to sing these rhythms that fast, but that's awesome. What are some little rhythmic changes and things that you notice? Things that even just singing, you're not worried about like what all the all the instruments are. Just little rhythmic things that you just like. Let me just enjoy that more. I think whenever it's like, definitely like the tuplets stand out. Exactly. I love the triplets in this piece because yeah. it's such a vertical driving piece. And then all of a sudden we get this like group of triplets thrown in there and it real, really feels very linear. So I, 
I don't know. I remember practicing this with the MIDI because when Andy writes music, he creates these beautiful MIDIs of his music. And that triplet is actually kind of fast, but like now when I play it, just open that up and just okay. enjoy that and like have that feel like one little gesture that goes to that top pipe there. Yeah. yeah. Let's try one more time. Okay. Uh, ready. <laughs> awesome. Cool. Cool. So I see we have here like these accents thrown in here, yeah. or, or they're sort of highlighted as yeah. sort of carrot marks. I like to just like let those drive. Yeah. Okay. That's like kind of our thematic rhythm. Any right. Not actually, but like it's sort of thrown Stay, in there a little yeah. bit, you know, so we can really let that sort of like drive to that first stick click. Um, so much for going slow, we're, we're totally going <laughs> fast. Um, and there's like a thousand notes on the page, right? You know, and, and it's kind of up to you. I mean, the, the composer will give you lots of clues as to which ones are the important ones, but, but I always like to think of like, there being just like a whole spectrum of ways to play those thousand notes and that there are the ones that you're going towards and then there's kind of the connective tissue of notes. And the more you play it, the more you can really kind of highlight that difference and help kind of distill it down for the audience because so if, if the audience is like getting all thousand notes, it can be hard to be like, whoa, like what was that experience? And you can really help show us we're going from this one to that one, and sure, there's a hundred in between, but you can really paint that picture yeah. for us. Yeah. And it, it reminds me, actually, um, and I'll, I'll tell a quick story. I know we have unlimited time, or we don't have <laughs> unlimited time. We have limited time. Um, when we worked on this piece, Seven Pillars, with Andy, um, we had a series of different sort of recording residencies that took up sort of a year uh, of our time, kind of around the time of the pandemic. Um, and one of those residencies, uh, we were recording, we were sort of editing and mixing what we recorded, and then off in the other room in our studio in Brooklyn, Andy was writing this piece, actually. <laughs> so he was in this room literally with this setup, the, the setup that I had sort of built with him, improvising and composing the piece as we're sort of like mixing the rest of the movements in the other room. And it was just so fascinating. I, I, maybe afterwards I can pull up some videos and show you. Um, it was so fascinating to watch him work because, it, to watch him compose that because he truly composed this music in a very improvisational way, specifically for these instruments laid out in this way. So it is like, it should breathe and feel like a drum set player who's just like living with a groove or living with a song or a tune, right? It really feels very organic in that way. I bet if Andy had written this piece totally away from the instruments, it would also be really cool, but it would just be so different, right? So it really has to feel very improvised and free. And once you do all the work to sort of really learn what's on the page, then you have the freedom to sort of depart from that. I think that this is such an important point because when Andy improvises, the, the rhythmic patterns, the rudimental patterns that he chooses, that's his way of being expressive. In the same way a great jazz pianist might choose different harmonies or different colors to be expressive in, their, in, in what, what, what they're improvising, Andy chooses a double paradiddle here or to hit the pipes right here. And right now what I feel when you're playing this is an amazing degree of execution that you've studied this music so much, and when you see double paradiddle, you play a double paradiddle. When you see accent, you play accent. What I don't hear yet is you taking it one step further and asking yourself the question, why did he choose a triplet in that moment, like you were just talking about? Why did he choose a double paradiddle instead of a single paradiddle here? What does that make me feel? How does that pattern, how does it sound different than this other pattern? You need to answer those questions for yourself, and they might be different from what Andy thinks, but I, I want you to go a little bit further in trying to understand why those notes are on the page and not just execute them. Yeah. I, have a, I have a question for Victor. Um, <laughs> you were just talking about uh, sort of like, like o taking some ownership over the piece and I'm actually looking at the score for like the second time ever. <laughs> um, I've mostly only ever listened to Victor play the piece and I've, I rarely have looked closely at the details of the score. Um, one thing I'm noticing is there's not a ton of dynamic information from Andy in the piece, actually. And I think some of that is it's like placement, like you were talking about in the beginning, it's placement in the whole of Seven Pillars. Um, but I wonder if maybe this is a moment for us to give you some permission 
that, that, that ownership for you might be with respect to dynamics, actually, that uh, if it is truly fortissimo for all six pages here, that is a whole lot for us to handle. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm mostly reacting this way because I don't, I wouldn't have dictated fortissimo if I were to tell you what Victor plays when he plays the yeah. piece. It's actually something quite different. And so maybe that's the, there's something in there, Vic. There's like, a lot of spectrum for expressive qualities inside of dynamics, or, or rather using dynamics, I think, especially in A to B, <laughs> because yeah. A to B is just so long, you know, and, and it's, there's so, there's actually, we recorded a video, and maybe you noticed, if you watched it, there's actually a big cut in it, because we just felt like it just was kind of going on a little bit too long for what the dance was and all that. Anyway, <laughs> let's look at a spot where I think yeah. that we can actually maybe, maybe try a dynamic thing to, to sort of insert here. This is right before we get to B, so this is... Let's start at A2. I like that you call it A2. That's, that's kind of how I think of it. This is 79. Um, and for the one person here who has the score, <laughs> um, there's these cool little moments where we're like, we're humming along, it's going crazy, it's a drum solo, and then all of a sudden, and then we're back into it, right? This one right here I really love because it's actually coming out of this sort of like, um, sextuplet that's in 25, 24, right? It yeah. really feels like the time sort of like all of a sudden shifts into like a lower gear and we're going slower. Yeah. Let's use that actually and, and think of it actually a little bit more dynamically as well as rhythmically where we get here. Uh, and then we really surprise everyone and come out here. There's just a moment here where we can really like float ourselves down to that because every other time, it's a surprise, right? Got, 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 got. Maybe this time, actually, it's the opposite, right? We really sort of like sink into it, and all of a sudden, we're left with this very stark. Right, let's try that. And we have like, we're, we're out of time already, so we'll just try this, and then, um, can we try it from A2? Yeah. Okay, cool. Great, excellent, excellent. Really good, really good. I'm, I'll add one more thing for you to think, because I know we're getting to that moment. On these quintuplets, can those really feel different than the straight sort of 30-second note sort of like check patterns that we're playing? So we have like a lot of... Really round on those quintuplets. Okay. I don't care if they're slow. They could even okay. be slow. Like, let's actually go too far and make them too slow that we really feel nice and like wide and fat and like on those, on those quintuplets, right? So it really feels like we're building this contour, this building this, uh, this map of sorts. One more time, I won't stop you, then there's that, and then trying into this woodblock thing, yeah. Can we, good, good, it's, it's, it's close. Can we start right before it? Is that possible? I know it's hard to start in the middle of these things. Um. And what I'm starting to hear more of, which is, is really nice, Nathan, is the, the, that there are these motifs, right? Like, even though it, it, it can look like all this chaos, like schizophrenic music, which is kind of the point of this opening, I think, like, there are these little motifs, whether it's the stick click or the quintuplet or the triplet or, uh, or, or the colors that we're using. I like to think of those motifs almost like, like harmonies, like we're going from a, a four chord to a two chord, to a five chord to, like, and maybe you get like a one chord at some point, but thinking of each one, like, you would play those chords a little differently. You can play these motifs a little differently and think Especially about that motion. Like every time these. Like, let's have that be really like, like chattery at him. And like sometimes Andy, when he's composing, he's like this all the time, and he's like, I'm trying to figure out what it is, and it's like it's this little like bug that's inside, right under under your skin, right? <laughs> really different from the sort of driving woodblock cigar box music, right? Okay. One more time, and I think we gotta stop. <laughs> Can that 
like really far away there. Cool. Then the map of the piece actually becomes you being able to shift that character in a split yeah. second from this thing to that thing to that other thing and, and really making that seem as fine and precise as possible. And that's how this piece just like comes into focus. It's nice. Awesome. Yeah, bravo. <laughs> Woo!